Hi, everyone. I'm Ann Fullenweider. I'm one of the co-founders and co-CEOs of Alloy Women's Health. And we're so pleased to host this webinar with Dr. Sharon Malone, our Chief Medical Advisor, and Dr. Mary Claire Haver, uh, founder of the Galveston Diet and just one of our favorites, biggest um, advocates for menopause out there. Um, we were just talking about how much everyone is now talking about menopause, which is wonderful. Uh, I will just do a quick introduction of our experts and I'll kind of guide the, the conversation with a few questions that we've come up with in advance. We would love to take your questions as well. Just drop those in the Q&A button, not the chat button. Um, and I'll be monitoring that as we go through. We're gonna try to do a little bit of Menopause 101 for the beginning. I know lots of people here already know a lot about this, but we just wanna cover the basics. Um, and then we also wanna hit on some recent news about women's health, um, talk about how, what we can do to stay healthy and feel good during this time of life, um, and then really give over the last half of the hour to, to you all for your questions. So I'm gonna introduce our illustrious panelists. Dr. Mary Claire Haver is a wife, a mom, a physician, an author, an entrepreneur who has devoted her adult life to women's health. As a board certified OBGYN in the Houston region, Dr. Haver has delivered thousands of babies, completed thousands of well woman exams, counseled patients, taught residents, and did everything in an academic professor and OBGYN could do. She's also the creator of the Galveston Diet and Anti-Inflammatory Nutrition Program, specifically designed for women in menopause. And I should add that both our experts today are certified, board certified OBGYNs and um, certified by the Menopause Society, which um, used to be called NAMS, but we're getting used to the new name. Uh, Dr. Sharon Malone, who is Alloy's Chief Medical Advisor, is a nationally known expert in women's health. Before joining Alloy, Dr. Malone was a partner at one of the oldest and most successful OBGYN medical practices in Washington, D.C. She is board certified by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and certified by the Menopause Society as a certified national menopause practitioner. Throughout her professional career, she's been active in reproductive rights, reducing teen pre pregnancy, and eliminating health care disparities. We're so pleased to have you both here. And again, I'll ask a question and kind of ask one of you, but please feel free to jump in um, and converse with each other because there's nothing like talking, hearing two really smart doctors who know everything about women's health to, um, talk together. So let's just start with very basic things first. Uh, Dr. Malone, what is menopause and what is perimenopause? Yes, um, perimenopause, or we also like to call it the menopausal transition is that period between a woman and when her peak fertility is usually, you know, in her 20s and 30s and menopause. Menopause is the time in which you have had your last menstrual period. The average age for that is 51. And it is confirmed by having had your last period plus a year. And that's just, you know, a, that's an arbitrary designation that we use. So we know um, when you're done and when you can reasonably stop using birth control. So sandwiched between those two, your, your premenopausal or your peak fertility years and menopause is this period what we call perimenopause or the menopausal transition. It can last anywhere from four to 10 years um, as you are you know, making that transition. And a lot of the symptoms that we think about that we associate with menopause really start in that perimenopausal window. Um, and so how long that lasts really depends upon the individual and your own risk factors and your own health uh, factors into doing that. So think of the perimenopause as that sort of in-between stage. Usually it happens for women in their 40s. Thank you. Another basic one for Dr. Mary Claire Haver. What would you say are the five most common symptoms of menopause? Um, and are these different from those in perimenopause? And we were just speaking before we hopped on about a very obscure but personally interesting symptom, which is itchy ears. But I know there are more symptoms that are much yeah. more common. If you could outline those for us, please. So there are symptoms that I was taught in school that we read about in the textbook that are classically associated with perimenopause and menopause. It's really hard to differentiate symptomatology between the two. It tends to get worse as you get closer to menopause, but any of the symptoms of menopause can start in perimenopause. So what, you know, what Dr. Malone and I were taught in school were menstrual disruption. So changes in your menstrual cycle, it could be heavier, lighter, shorter, longer, really, you know, anything goes as far as your periods go. Another is hot flashes, another is night sweats, and, you know, also, some mood changes are recognized. 
but there was a recent survey that was done in a menopause clinic and it looked at 22,000 responses. And the number one complaint was body composition and weight changes. Um, the number two complaint was brain fog and memory issues. The number mm. three complaint was me uh, memory and anxiety and depression. And so memory went with number two. Number four was sleep changes. And number five was finally hot flashes, which is the traditionally most commonly recognized symptom. So what kind of, you know, as this menopause explosion is happening with research and people really talking about it, we're learning that there's a lot more symptoms than we ever recognized before. And what we thought was the most common actually maybe isn't. It's fascinating. And it's one of the reasons I want to talk about how to feel your best during this time, because I think body changes and brain changes really um, are what a lot of my friends are talking about. Certainly what we hear our um, customers at Alloy talking about as well. Um, and guys, I know these are really basic to start off and we'll get into the more complex, but Dr. Malone, what is the simplest and best thing we, the majority of women can do to treat their symptoms of menopause? You know, I think that something that is really overlooked. We spend a lot of time talking about hormones and treatments for perimenopause and menopause, but regardless of what or whether or not that is even appropriate for you, how you show up in perimenopause really matters. So the healthier you are entering this space, mm -hmm. The, the better you're going to do regardless of what you do afterwards. So that includes things, you know, diet, exercise, getting enough sleep. Um, these are all just sort of basic things, but they're basic health, you know, the healthier you are, the better you're going to make this transition. And so I say this to say, regardless of whether you're talking about perimenopause or heart disease or Alzheimer's prevention, it's the same basic things that you need to do. And I think that, you know, and, and let's not forget decreasing the stress level in your life, which is sometimes easier said than done, but you know, they're all interrelated. You know, you can't really address one without sort of impacting the others. Right. So stress affects weight, you know, uh, stress affects sleep, you know, sleep deprivation. You know, this is in, in, intimately tied to weight gain. Um, and just generally how you feel, you know, women who weigh more are going to have more hot flashes. So, you know, if you think about it, it's something that perimenopause and menopause is really a, a phase of your life that you should prepare for, not wait until it's on you and then try to figure out what to do about it. And that's why I think that having this conversation with women who are younger in their 30s and early 40s is a good time to have this conversation because, you know, 50, it's like, well, why didn't you tell me this 10 years ago? Um, it would have been helpful. And I think this is where we've really got to change this conversation and to give more anticipatory guidance. Mm -hmm. You know, and that being said, you can still all do all of these things and still end up with some of the symptoms that uh, uh, Dr. Haver just talked about. And then we can talk about, all right, you've done that. Now, what are the things that you do? And I completely agree. In my clinic, I call it the menopause toolkit you know, and the first and foremost is nutrition, which is kind of my background and where I, how I ended up where I am today. Then we talk about exercise, both resistance training and cardiovascular training. Both are very, very important in menopause because we are losing muscle mass at unprecedented rates as we go through the menopause transition. Um, finally, we talk about, you know, supplementation, if you have any nutritional gaps. So, you know, we talk about stress reduction, sleep, and then we talk about hormone replacement therapy or other pharmacology that might be helpful for you. And Dr. Haver, we were talking about this a little bit just before, but also we've all been talking about it for quite a while. Why, what is the confusion out there about hormones and why, why is that? And what is the basic advice about hormones for the vast majority of healthy women? So it turns out that the vast majority of healthy women absolutely can take hormone therapy. And the research has been pointing to this for years, but is now kind of, now that we've been able to like calm down about the WHI and realize that a lot of that data was misconstrued and blowed out of proportion, that even if you feel fantastic in your menopause, um, you know, right now, clinical indications for hormone therapy are to treat your symptoms, or your hot flashes, night sweats, sleep disruption, et cetera. But, you know, I have people come to me and say, hey, I feel fine. Other than my period stopping, I don't have a symptom. And I said, well, 
you might be missing out on some of the cardioprotective benefits, neuroprotective benefits, your bones aren't going to be as strong, your genital urinary system isn't going to be as healthy. You know, there are definite things that may not bother you right now that you may be missing an opportunity to decrease some risk as we age. Right. And Dr. Malone, I know it's a giant topic, but just when, when Dr. Haber says the WHI, can we just talk for a second about what that is? Not Maybe not everyone knows what it is, although I feel like everyone in my world sure. sounds oh. like saying DMV. Right. right. We talk about it, you know, incessantly. <laughs> All day. Um, but, you know, for those of us, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm in the older age group. And I tell you, we, the Women's Health Initiative, which is this major study that was done, reported out 21 years ago, uh, is really responsible for a lot of the misperceptions that we have about hormone replacement therapy. And I'd say the number one complaint or the number one concern that women have is really about breast cancer. And we didn't, you didn't make that up. You know, that was really what the headline that came out of that study is, oh my goodness, the study was supposed to just let us know whether or not it proved whether or not hormone replacement therapy decreased the risk of cardiovascular disease. We didn't need a study to say, does it treat the symptoms of menopause? I mean, hormone replacement is not new. It's been around since 1942. We knew that. And that was really why it was used. But in the uh, run up to that, as we sort of observed what was happening to women who took hormone replacement versus women who didn't, just in observational studies, we saw that these women who took hormones had a 50% decrease in the risk of cardiovascular disease. That was why the Women's Health Initiative was really um, started. It was going to cement that observation um, into our, our medical practice, which we had been doing anyway. Um, and it would have been great if it had done that. It was a large scale, randomized, double blind control study where you were given, women were given hormone replacement therapy, estrogen and progestin if you had a uterus, estrogen alone if you had had a hysterectomy, and they were to be observed for 10 years, is I think what this study was supposed to run for. Well, at the five year mark, they abruptly stopped the study because they found no benefit as far as cardiovascular disease was concerned. And the headlines that screeched across the nation was really the increase in the risk of breast cancer. Now, you can imagine um, what that did to the use uh, and the prescriptions that were given for hormone replacement therapy, I mean, they precipitously dropped off. Before that, about 40% of women were on hormone replacement therapy, and it dropped down to about six almost overnight. Um, and the unfortunate thing about that is that the Women's Health Initiative really gave us a lot of good data. But, and here's the but, and here was the big problem with the study, it was not started at the age that women typically take hormone replacement therapy. You know, all of the data with the decrease in heart disease that we had prior to this study, we started with women when they're symptomatic and take it for as long as you want to take it after that. This study started women who were on average 63 years of age. They were 12 years or more after having had their last menstrual period. So it was a much older cohort. So just imagine if you're trying to do a study that shows that it prevents something, it probably would be a good idea to start the study before people actually had the disease that you were trying to present, prevent. And that's why they couldn't prove the cardiovascular Mm -hmm. part of it. And then the second big piece of it was the increase in the risk of, of breast cancer, which turns out um, has been widely, widely, widely misinterpreted. Um, and that will be a whole other section right, that we have home. about mm -hmm. you know, how many ways they got that wrong. But it turns out that the good information that we got from the Women's Health Initiative that is that timing matters. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't start hormone replacement therapy for someone who's 75 and expect to have good results. But if you start hormone therapy around the time of the natural menopause or within 10 years of their last menstrual period, then it turns out that the things that we thought we were actually addressing, such as the decrease in the risk of cardiovascular disease, we actually, that is what they observed, even in the Women's Health Initiative. And it turns out that the increased risk of breast cancer for women who take it around the same thing, 
you know, around the time of natural menopause or um, within 10 years, that that increase in risk of breast cancer does not hold up. And that's the part that I think that never got communicated. Um, we just sort of put everything all in the same basket and assumed that the same effects that, that hormones had on a 75-year-old were going to be the same as a 45-year-old. And that's the unfortunate piece of this study. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's sort of what changed everything for the past 21 years where hormones went from being a godsend for symptomatic women and perhaps, you know, um, decreasing their risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis to being, uh, you know, a pariah uh, in women's health. And that's the damage that Dr. Uh, Haver and I are trying to sort of walk back and explain to people that, you know, we didn't get new data. It's just really reinterpreting the data that we already had. And, you know, even amongst our own profession, there are still probably the majority of people who trained at our age level and beyond that still believe this. One of the problems is, you know, and I'm a board certified member of the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. We have CME that we're supposed to um, read articles every year and then answer questions to keep our board certification up. There is almost never anything to do with menopause. There's lots of great things there, obstetrics, pediatrics, surgical techniques. But when you go back and you look for updates on the WHI and, and you know, the safety of hormone therapy in 2023, you know, other than last year when the American Heart Association article came out, you know, in Circulation Magazine talking about heart disease and how it actually is helpful, there really hasn't been a lot. So it's common that you will go to your healthcare provider and they will not be up to date on, and there's several reasons for that. So, you know, we're telling you this and then you will turn around and go to your doctor and they don't know this yet. I think that's a great um, segue to ask you both briefly, because I do think from what I've gathered and what my own experience, most OBGYNs are in the baby delivery and fertility and sort of dealing with younger women. What is it in each of your own careers, and I'll ask you, Dr. Haver, first, that led you to want to devote so much of your time to menopausal women? Um, so I was a traditional OB-GYN in academic practice. I was the residency program director. I was super busy delivering everybody on the university's babies, you know, doing surgery, su supervising surgery, and really in, in a bread and butter ob -GYN practice, that's how you you make money, you know, well, woman exams are basically a great way to provide, you know, holistic health care, but it's also feeding into the things that really pay the bills with your procedures and surgery. And mm -hmm. as I started going through the menopause transition and struggling and having body composition changes, which led to the Galveston diet, another story, you know, I got busy on social media talking about it. And I just realized from women begging me by the million you know, help me. I, there's, I don't know enough. I, I don't, you know, I can't get answers from my physician and I was doing all of this on my own. And at the time I was hot, I left OBGYN traditional when it became a hospitalist so I could go part-time. And I remember taking like six of my girlfriends out to dinner and saying, I really want to open a menopause clinic. Do you think this would work? You're like, would you come? <laughs> and they're like, are you kidding? You know, it was, I've always been employed. I'd never opened my own practice. I didn't know what I was doing. And so for me, I saw a need, but it was so outside of the traditional mold of how we were paid, you know, that it, you have to be, you know, so I thought, I'm just going to go on a leap of faith here and see if I can make this happen. And it worked. Women are really, really, really excited about a clinician specific to just doing menopause care. I think that certainly that's what we found when we started Alloy several years ago. And I have been amazed um, since we started at the need and the great desire. I mean, I can see in the chat already, we have so many questions, really specific scientific questions because people are really, women and people with ovaries are extremely hungry for this information and really want to feel better and get, get that information. Um, Dr. Malone, I know a little bit more of your story, partly because I chased you down to find you to join us at Alloy. But what was it? I know you were delivering babies and, and, and doing everything that an OBGYN does. And what was it about your um, career or moment that you thought, I would really want to focus on menopause? You know, I think, you know, it, it does matter how old you are, 
you know, because I think you get a little bit more interested in things while you <laughs> in it, you know, when mm -hmm. I'm having babies, I could, you know, jump in there and relate to all of my patients. That was it. But I say this, you know, and I say this in fairness to my OBGYN co uh, colleagues, we're asked to do a lot of things in the course mm -hmm. of a day. And we're asked to do it and do it quickly. And, you know, and if you're trying to, in the course of a delay, deliver babies, do surgery, you know, take care of an 80 year old, take care of a 10 year old. I mean, it's, it's just a lot. Mm -hmm. And the squeeze in medicine just does not give you time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't give you because, you know, menopause is a conversation. It's not a five minute, take this, see you next year type of proposition. And, you know, I made the decision somewhere around mid-career after about 15 years in, I said, you know, I was, you know, the OB thing, it's like, yeah, I'm going to leave that to the younger people. And I'm going to focus on <laughs> midlife and beyond. And we're going to talk about this menopause thing. And we're going to talk about it in detail. And the beauty of being in one place for as long as I had been in that same practice for 28 and a half years, I had actually seen, you know, women through high school, through college, to having babies, to being perimenopausal. And so the conversations that I could have with patients did take place over years, not in one conversation. And that's not the lived reality for most women. You know, that is not what's going to happen today. You're not going to have one doctor that you're going to grow up with and grow old with. Um, and we have got to find a better paradigm for delivering care. And that's really when I left my practice, I actually um, was thinking about, you know, what to do. And when um, Anne and Monica, the founders of Alloy Women's Health approached me, I said, you know what, this makes total sense because you can take the expertise of a few doctors and really, you know, sort of take, a, you can use that as a multiplier because we do not have enough OBGYNs we do not have enough certified menopause practitioners out there in the world who are going to be able to address the overwhelming need um, out here in the population. So yes, I, I, Mary Claire and I understand this completely. We, they're asked a lot. And I think that when you're asked to do a lot too, it is really hard to keep up with the literature. That's you it. have to have a particular desire mm -hmm. to do this you know, and to say, let me keep current. Let me make sure that I'm on top of this. So I know the right things to um, um, sort of advise my patients. And what I think is most distressing for me is that even when you've done the work and taken the time and you give your patients what you think is your best advice, they go to see their internist or they go to see their cardiologist. And then they will say, oh, why are you on this? You know, and I'm I don't change your insulin prescription. I don't change your high blood pressure medication because that's not what I do. Right. But for whatever reason, when it comes to hormone replacement therapy, everybody thinks they have an equal say in the conversation. And I just wish sometimes they would just say, you know what, either if you have a question, talk to me or talk to the prescribing physician. You don't make that kind of decision with patients. And that's unfortunately what happens for a lot of women. They, they get it and then they get waved off and they get scared, so. Well, that is um, one of the reasons, I mean, there are about roughly 55 million women in menopause or some state of menopause in the US right now. And per the last check of the Menopause Society, which used to be called North American Menopause Society's list, there are certainly under 1500 certified menopause practitioners. Um, and the, that is the sort of gold standard is that North American Menopause Society, which is now called the, the Menopause Society. Um, and that's just not enough. That, yeah. that math just doesn't work out, right? So it, we're so grateful to doctors like yourselves to are spreading the word and getting the news out there. And that's why we started Alloy, which is a telehealth platform where you can come and have a consult with a doctor and, and be prescribed what is right for you and your menopause symptoms. Um, and I'll give a quick little plug and then I'm gonna go back to um, what we've been talking about, but you can um, receive a $20 discount off your first purchase at Alloy if you um, use the, co the coupon HEALTH20. And at the Galveston Diet, you can receive a, uh, $15 off, I believe, on the new 
Galveston meals, which I can't wait to try mm -hmm. myself. And that code is TGD15. And both mm -hmm. of those codes are in the chat. Um, so back to our regularly scheduled program here. Um, we called alloy alloy because it means a fusion of elements for strength and protection. Hormone replacement therapy is a huge piece of menopause care. But as we were discussing earlier, there's just a lot about your body and your sleep and your stress and your mood and your memory that also kind of happens all at the same time. So I wanted to ask you, Dr. Haver, you've written a great book about the diet, but I also know you're a big strength um, condition, a strength, what is it, strength? You, wait, you lift a lot of weight. Training. Yeah. Yeah, strength training. <laughs> I try. Um, <laughs> what are some um, sort of quick hits tips you can give us? Because really sometimes menopause feels like it can be the beginning of old age and mm -hmm. we really don't want people to give up or feel like that. And how can they feel stronger and better in addition to uh, taking their hormones? So most patients who come to my office are doing some form of uh, exercise activity, um, unless they're injured or you know some something extraordinary. But they're mostly doing cardio in the form of walking, which is great. You know, it all depends on where you start and what we can do to to improve things. And so if you're doing absolutely nothing, start walking. Okay, um, but if you're already walking, maybe get some hand weights or some wristbands to add, you know, a little bit of weight to your upper body, wear the backpack with a little weight in it while you're walking. All of those things will help with osteoporosis prevention, with keeping your muscles strong. You know, you always have to be challenging your body in different ways um, from a musculoskeletal and cardiovascular standpoint. So try to mix up your workouts, Maybe, uh, you know, if you can afford it, work with a trainer to get some basics, but there's so many free resources now available on YouTube, you know, um, really, really reasonable subscriptions to like the Peloton app or our Beachbody apps that, you know, will give you kind of a framework for you to get started. And Dr. Malone, I know you also are very fit and have have managed the transition very well yourself, but also what do you tell people about how to stay healthy and fit and not sort of, I think there's a, um, hopefully we're making this change now, but there is this idea of like, oh, menopause, I'm just gonna kind of roll over and waddle into old age. How do yeah. we not do that? You know what, I think, again, this gets back to what I was saying about the anticipatory guidance that you give people. And I think that when uh, my patients are in their late when they're in the late 30s, early 40s, I tell them straight up, between 40 and 50, if you do nothing other than what you're doing right now, even if you're exercising, eating right, doing everything you're supposed to do, you're going to gain probably at least 10 pounds. And that's if you're good. Okay. Most people will gain more than that between 40 and 50. Now I use this approach. I said, wouldn't it be just great to know that ahead of time? I, the advice I give them, I said, it's a lot easier to not gain one pound than it is to lose 10. So I'm telling you, don't, don't think you have something special here. That's what's going to happen. And so we start at making adjustments because you can do a lot of uh, short course adjustments, exercise, you know, um, and let me just say this, I, I, I almost have to back up on exercise. Exercise helps you maintain the weight you mm -hmm. lose. You do not lose weight exercising. So, you know, people will come in and they'll say, oh my God, I exercise and I've been to the gym and I haven't lost any weight. And I was like, because you do like we all do on the days you exercise, you eat more. You're like, oh yeah, I went to the gym. So I'll have two cookies. So, <laughs> but exercise is good on so many levels that independent of whether or not you um, lose any weight. So, you know, it's that kind of guidance. It's sort of telling you that, you know, it, it, it's just easier to do things if you know what's coming, you know, and also to get um, people to understand is that once you start becoming symptomatic, there's no virtue in waiting, you know, like what's the, why would you be miserable for five years without getting treatment, which these things, you know, even they do help because as uh, Dr. Haver was saying, one of the things that happens, even when you don't gain weight is you redistribute your body weight. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being around the middle and it's, it goes every place you don't want it to be. So it's now you've got a tummy. Now your breasts are bigger. All of this is happening. Um, even when you are weight neutral. So yeah. again, understanding that you've got to address your diet, you've got to, you know, increase your exercise for other reasons other than, um, than weight, weight loss. loss you know? That makes you feel better. 
I went running yeah, this morning. I, it helps I with feel sleep. So it helps with everything. I've got these little quick rules of 25. Like, you know, most women are not getting 25 grams of fiber in their diet per day. That's an easy place to start is using, and I'm not saying rush to a supplement. I'm saying, you, you know, download a free nutrition tracker. My favorite is chronometer. And because it's, it's built for nutrition, not for weight loss. And just track what you eat in a week on a normal basis and see how much fiber you're getting in your diet per day. And then use food. So nuts, seeds, legumes, you know, veggies, fruits to try to get that level up above 25 grams per day. And studies have shown that menopausal women who do that consistently have less visceral abdominal belly fat, less cortisol, less, you know, better insulin, you know, less insulin resistance than women who don't. The second rule of 25 is watching the added sugars in your diet. So added sugars are sugars added in cooking and processing. And the whole keto movement has moved people away from all carbohydrates. And because of that, you're not eating as much fruits and vegetables. If you're following that kind of program and you're missing the micronutrients there, you're missing that whole nutritional profile. So keeping those added sugars less than 25 grams per day seems to be, you know, on a consistent basis. Of course, we're all going to have a birthday or, you know, some special occasion. You can have that cookie. Um, but when you consistently keep those added sugar less than 25 grams, a miracle will happen if you've not been doing that before. Right. Um, the third is 25 minutes a day of something for your body, exercise, walking, resistance training, meditation, journaling, prayer, calling a girlfriend, like, you know, taking 25 minutes a day to focus on you and however that looks for you. If you're not doing that, you're going to make a world of difference there. Yeah. I love that. And you know what else I think that we spend too much time worrying about how we look. Mm -hmm. And let me just say, you know, a 50 year old does not look like a 30 year old. That's sorry, you know, but that's just the <laughs> reality. Um, I wish so we know who we are so much more, you know, we, we know what's not to worry about. Right. And I hate to tell you 60 does not look like 50. So, you know, there's <laughs> that too, but what the focus really should be for women as we age is not anti-aging is to age well, to age pro-aging and to say, I'm going to worry about function. I'm going to worry about not just what I look like. I'm going to worry about what I can do. I'm going to worry about making sure that, you know, the weight, I don't, I don't bug people so much about the weight unless, you know, you're in a category where you're clearly unhealthy, but I say, look at your metabolic profile to see, you know, do you have hypertension? Do you have diabetes? What's your cholesterol? These kinds of things are important because you can be metabolically healthy at a weight that is perhaps not desirable for you. Cause those are two different things. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't really care that you wear a size six or a size eight or a size 10. If you are metabolically healthy by doing mm -hmm. the things that Dr. Haber was saying, addressing your diet and exercising, then yeah, so what? You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna we're gonna be okay with that because health is really the focus that we're trying to get to. Yes. Not, not and health through our old age, right? Until we live to right. 100, right? Mm -hmm. You wanna age healthfully. Exactly. Exactly. I can't so guys, agree got... more. I mean, I can't agree more with that. It is, I spend so much time taking, talking people off the ledge about a number on the scale and showing them, because I have a body scanner in my office and I can measure their muscle mass and visceral fat, but you know, you can do that at home with a waist to brace you. And mm -hmm you know, you're healthy, reassuring them, like you are going to age beautifully. You're going to be able to think and move and, and climb that mountain and pick up that grandbaby and do all the things where if you just pursue thin, you're going to lose out on that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, you be miserable, by the way. Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is that's leading me to so many other questions. I'm really dying to know um, so many more of what we said, but I promise everyone we get to questions. And I know um, we will also, also want to talk about the newly released over-the-counter birth control pill because it's exciting and, and confusing at the same time. We have about 25 minutes. I'm going to start. There's so many great questions here. Um, quite a few of them have to do with an IUD. And I thought that might be a great way to talk about progesterone and also maybe then bring in this new over-the-counter O pill, which I believe is progesterone only. Mm -hmm. So just a lot of questions about, um, I'm on an IUD kind of, there are a few more specifics in this, and I'll try to get to them everybody, but I'm on an IUD, how do I know if I'm in, in menopause? 
Um, and then what about kind of using an IUD in conjunction with HRT? So that's a lot. Um, I'll throw to you, Dr. Malone, maybe you can quickly talk about, um, let's start with the O-pill actually, and we'll then segue into IUDs and menopause. Okay. Um, the new over-the-counter um, contraceptive pill, O-pill, is a progestin-only pill. Most birth control pills that women have been using traditionally are a combination of estrogen and progestin, which is also why we can use those in perimenopause because it gives you contraception, but because it has the estrogen in it, it also treats some of the symptoms you may have um, during the menopausal transition. Now, let me say this because I think it's really important. It's not new, okay? We've yeah. had a progestin-only <laughs> pill forever. We've used it. We use it under circumstances. We use it in uh, for women who, you know, have had blood clots or for whatever reasons have contraindications to estrogen. We use it for nursing mothers. So not a new pill. We have ample experience with this, you know, probably 50 plus years of the use of the progestin only pill. So I think women should take some comfort in the fact that even if you're going to use this for younger women who need really need it for contraceptive benefits, um, in this day and age where we are, where we are with, um, you know, with women not having health insurance and being in this living in a, in a post Roe v. Wade era, it's great to have an over-the-counter um, option. Um, we're going to have to see where the price point comes in, but understand, not new. So I don't want anybody to think that, oh my God, there's this new thing out there in the world and it's a progestin-only pill. We've had ample experience with it. And not only that, the progestin that's in it is norgestrel, which is also uh, uh, a progestin, that a synthetic progestin that has been used in many birth control pills certainly since the 70s. So yeah. that's the good news about that. It's not new. It's going to be great for, for mainly for contraception. It's not going to be so great for women who are having perimenopausal symptoms because remember it's a progestin only pill. There's no estrogen in it. So again, great for some circumstances, not so much for the menopausal transition. And thank you. And so Tell me, IUDs, and this is really only about hormonal IUDs, are they also, Dr. Haver, progesterone only? Or how, so two questions, that one. And then how would someone know if you're on a hormonal IUD, so your periods have been suppressed? How do you know sure. if you're in menopause or not? Sure, so there are um, several versions out now of progesterone containing IUDs. The original IUDs that came out had no hormones in them. And the way that they worked was they, uh, thicken the cervical mucus to keep the sperm from, you know, created a little bit of an inflammatory environment that could basically wouldn't allow the sperm to get where they needed to go to fertilize anything. Um, someone got the idea to add progesterone to the IUDs years ago that would also be able to treat heavy periods, stop people's periods who didn't want to have them, et cetera. And so um, there's now a few versions out, you know, Morena was the original one. So one of the nice things for, for patients who are symptomatic is suppressing periods and where you stop having periods altogether because the progestin will thin the lining of the uterus over time uh, to achieve that goal. So how do you know if you're menopausal? What if you've had a hysterectomy or an ablation? You know, what if you're not having periods and how would you know that you're menopausal? Well, symptoms, number one is a clue. And then a simple blood test can tell you if you're completely menopausal. The problem is we don't have a great blood, urine, or saliva test that is going to accurately diagnose perimenopause. That is a clinical diagnosis based on symptoms, age, you know, paying attention to the patient, maybe blood work to rule out other things that have similar symptoms. But, you know, I know a lot of patients are wasting tons and thousands of dollars on really unnecessary testing when a good clinician should be able to diagnose your per perimenopause on symptoms alone. Okay, I'm reading these two um, questions specifically about IUDs that I feel. So if there's someone who um, had their gallbladder removed in the early 40s, they're now 50, um, still have Mirena IUD used for the past 15 years. I usually only spot it on the IUD, but ever since COVID vaccines, I get a regular period with an IUD. I have had itchy ears in the past couple of years, me too, um, and never thought that that was menopause related. What is the effect of HRT with IUD and gallbladder removal? 
that's quite quite a question, but I'm just gonna add another one so we can quickly, or maybe hopefully get to some more of these IUD questions. And then there are so many other questions. So here's someone else who says, I'm 56, I'm in the midst of period stopping five months now. I have an IUD and have been on HRT, HRT for 14 weeks, both progesterone and estrogen. Night sweats and hot flashes are gone. Weight gain continues to be ridiculous, up to 30 years and 30 pounds in two years. Mood seems less happy. I did not notice feeling this way prior to HRT. More joint and muscle pain. Is that due to the weight gain? I'm wondering if there's a contraindication to IUD and HRT. There's a lot in those questions, but maybe there's some IUD. Let me, um, let me answer the easy one first. No, actually, there's <laughs> not a contraindication to the progestin releasing IUD and taking hormones, which is estrogen only. Because remember, if you have a uterus, you've got to take estrogen and progestin. So you can get that progestin any number of ways. You can take it as a pill. You can take it as a combination with your patch. If you use a patch, there's one that actually has estrogen and progestin in it. Or you can use a progestin releasing IUD, which is a great um, segue for perimenopausal women, because if you have an IUD in place, a progestin releasing IUD, a Moreno or a Liletta, then it gives protection for the lining of the uterus. And then you can just use the estrogen for the symptom relief. So no, it is not a contraindication and it is a good option because I think now the, um, they've extended the time. It went from five years to six years. Are we now up to eight years that you can eight. keep the the Morena. Eight. I don't know about Loletta, but for sure yeah. the Morena is good for eight. So imagine that that's actually um, a good combination for people who use the patch. Because again, if you use the patch and you have a uterus, now you've got to use a patch and a pill still, because you still got to take your progestin if you have that. So if you already have an IUD in place, you can just use your patch. It's just easier uh, for women to use. So all the only reason that progestin is there is really to protect the lining of the uterus. All the heavy lifting is really going to come from the estrogen. And um, she's already had her gallbladder out, right? So mm -hmm. she's good. You know, that was one of the things that they found is that women who um, took estrogen, they, this is from the old women's health initiative, you know, again, not life-threatening, but there was a slightly higher instance in the um, in uh, gallstones for women who took estrogen and progestin. But if your gallbladder's out, not a problem. Weight gain, yeah, well, you know, there there have been a lot of uh, studies that sort of looked at this to say, is it estrogen? Is it menopause? What is it that causes the weight gain? And the reality is, is that it's aging. After you get through the perimenopausal phase, um, what happens for most women is that as you lose muscle, you gain fat, muscle is less metabolic, I mean, uh, fat is less metabolically active than muscle. So, you know, that weight that you gain and you put it on is fat and it just sits there and it's really hard to get off. And the more weight you gain, the less active you are. The less active you are, the more you're, you already had some joint pain and now you're putting 30 extra pounds of weight on those knees and hips, you're gonna get more joint pain. So again, a lot of the symptoms that we talk about, none of them happen in isolation. They all sort of come together. Um, you know, depression makes you gain weight, not sleeping makes you gain weight. So all of these things have to be considered um, in, you know, in a particular patient. I will say as someone who's gained a lot of weight in my perimenopause, almost menopause years, I was very helped by reading the Galveston diet. And thank you, Dr. Haber, for really You're putting welcome. that together. Um, I'm going to quickly do another plug. And then we have 80, 91 questions now and about 15 minutes left. So we're going to fly through some of them. But I also want to let everyone know we'll do this again. And also we are recording this and it will be up on our YouTube channel and we'll send it to Dr. Haber so she could do that as well. Um, and we really want to get to all of your questions and we'll try. One last thing is there are specific alloy questions in there. And Kristen, if you're still on, I'm wondering if you can just go in and type the answers to the alloy questions. If you have an, if you are an alloy customer, you can go to your dashboard and ask your, your alloy doctor those questions and the doctor will get back to you within two business days. And that um, goes on you know, for the whole length of your membership. And you can also go to your dashboard to ask your doctor about dosage. There was someone who said they're not feeling quite better yet. And I know not being the doctor on the call, but I think both doctors will agree that if you're not feeling better yet, you can up your dose of both the estrogen and the progesterone. Um, okay, I think this is a great question for every. Oh, by the way, just one more plug. TGD15 is the <laughs> discount code for Galveston Meals and Health20 is the $20 off your purchase at Alloy. Um, and th again, those are in the 
um, chat as well. So I love this question because it kind of gets at everything we're talking about. Um, this is a question that says, when I was in my reproductive years, going to my OBGYN every year seemed like all the healthcare I needed. Now that I'm officially menopausal, my gynecologist has told me I don't need to visit every year. What should healthcare look like for me now? A family practitioner every year and for seasonal illness plus gyne only for mammogram follow-ups and paps? I don't feel like I've, I've gotten much direction. Uh, Dr. Unfortunately, Hayes, you want to take that one? unfortunately, in clinical practice, for most people who are doing menopause care, it has devolved into a breast exam and pap smear. Um, very little proactive, you know, teaching about, you know, what happens in menopause and how certain health fat, you know, risks increase and what can we do to attenuate these risks, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, in my menopause clinic, I'm not doing procedures. So they must go back to their, whoever is doing their pap smears and they're ordering their mammograms. You know, I can order all that stuff, but, um, and so, you know, it really is hit or miss. And until we change the curriculum of menopause education and our OBGYN training programs and in family medicine and internal medicine to really, you know, give something that is, is worthwhile and evidence-based, um, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle. Yeah. And, you know, my practice has always been this, you know, usually, you know, I think for younger women seeing your OBGYN once a year, cause you know, you don't have a lot of things that you're, you've got to take care of when you're between 40 and 50, it's time to start thinking about getting an internal medicine doctor, even if you don't go every year. And then after 50, Absolutely. Have an, have a primary care doctor who's an internist who takes care of all the other things that are going to happen, but continue to see your OBGYN. And I think this is something that is, is confusing because as the pap smear recommendations have changed, now you don't have, you have your pap smear every year. And that was the hook that always got women back to get their uh, exams. Now you can get your pap smear every three years. And then that, but that doesn't mean don't go every three years because there are other things that you may not think are important, but that we may ask you about, such as irregular bleeding. We watch your weight. And let me, and I'll say this last thing about why it's important to continue to go to your OBGYN is because your OBGYN may be the last person, the last doctor who is going to see you naked. And somebody needs to see you naked at least once a year. And that is because, you know, if you go to your internist, you don't get undressed, you know, <laughs> looking at your breast exam, let me look and see, even if I'm not doing a pap smear, there are things that we do that are just visual that are, you know, oh, you didn't realize you had fibroids. If no one ever examines you, and they never look at that. There may be things that you didn't know that we see that we catch, which I think is very important. So, you know, between even after 50, go every year. And then in addition to that, see your internal medicine doctor. You know, your care just sort of changes because your needs change as you get older. Speaking of, as we get older, I'm going to quickly, there's a couple of, I'm now scanning through these amazing questions. I promise you we'll do this again and we'll try to answer some of these questions maybe with some recordings later. Um, but I thought this, we haven't talked at all about vaginal symptoms and um, someone saying, I have been having recurring, recurrent UTIs for about a year. I just recently, my GP prescribed Premarin. I don't know if that's Premarin cream or Premarin systemic um, uh, the other, you know, the systemic form, but she says, should I expect any result? It's always a domino effect. One test leads to another. So recurrent UTIs and menopause and what we can do about that. So, um, remember that vaginal, and I'm hoping it's vaginal estrogen that she has been given general urinary syndrome of menopause is a catch-all that includes atrophy, recurrent UTIs, you know, everything to do with the menopausal changes in the vagina and vulva. And even with recurrent UTIs, the, the treatment of choice is going to be vaginal estrogen. It is going to take up to three months for that medication to build up that lining back to its premenopausal state and it can actually get there. And so, um, so it's not a one-time treatment. It is not like taking antibiotics. We are trying to rebuild the health, the thickness, and the, the you know, the, the pH of the vagina, all of that dramatically changes with menopause and the, so if you are suffering and having symptoms that severe, I would say give it at least three months of consistent therapy before you would expect to see a big change. Um, 
and we've got some great videos on YouTube about the vaginal symptoms. We spoke with a, um, a couple of urologists and there's so much more to learn there. Vaginal estrogen, some people think we should just all be using at a certain point because, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is, and then of course those symptoms might not show up till later um, than the earlier, like the hot flashes, et cetera. But um, mm -hmm. I know that so many women have been helped by that, not just for UTIs, but also, um, you know, frequent um, incontinence and painful sex and itching and burning. So um, we all love vaginal estrogen. Um, okay, there's so many questions here. I'm gonna just quickly ask someone, someone had another great one that, um, <laughs> any recommendations for someone who cannot take HRT but has been hot flashing for nine years? Dr. Well, Malone. Yes, I can give you one. Now, good news is that we have a new option. You know, for women who cannot take estrogen, either you've had, you know, cancer or undiagnosed vaginal bleeding, liver disease, or blood clotting, uh, hereditary blood clotting, um, sometimes we can use progestin only. This is one of those situations where using micronized progesterone at bedtime will sometimes help with hot flashes. That's an option. But now for the first time, we do have, now this is indeed a new medication, which is Vioza, which is the medication that works um, only in the brain. It does not treat the other symptoms of menopause other than hot flashes um, that we know of. This is a new medication just out, I think it was out, what, a month ago? Very clear. Uh, six six yeah. Yeah. Uh, the downside, so that is an option. It is certainly um, something for women who are, who are only in that niche. It should not be used just to treat hot flashes because, you know, if you're having normal menopausal symptoms and you do not have contraindications to hormone replacement therapy, because one, we don't know what the long-term implications are going to be of this medication. It's only, you know, they, we have a year's worth of data on the OZA and it appears to be um, effective in hot flashes. What happens in year 10? I don't know. You don't either. So, um, and the biggest thing is that it's expensive. I think it clocks in at <laughs> 550. Um, yeah, a month. That's a lot. That's a lot. And so, you know, when you, we have effective medications out there for women for whom it is not contraindicated, don't let the newness of the Vioza, you know, sort of steer you away from something that we've got that's safe, it's effective and cheap. So. Mm -hmm. This is another great question that's obviously could be a whole other hour. And in fact, we will be doing, um, Aloy will be doing a, another webinar only on brain health. But um, this one, I think you guys will both have thoughts on. It is a giant topic. We'll try to summarize it within our time limit, but there's more to say here and we'll, and we'll be doing that later. But it says, I've started HRT because among other things, it protects you from dementia, which my mother got. I'm very worried about the recent study that said that HRT may increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Who to believe? Okay, Dr. well, there are multiple studies before this latest one came out that have shown a tremendous protective benefit um, for certain patients um, for both, you know, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia for women. And um, this particular study um, was an observational study. So we really can't prove cause and effect with observation. And the women who were on hormone therapy were only had severe symptoms. Remember, in most countries, the only women being treated right now because of the WHI are people who there's no, they can't survive without it. Okay. And we know that severe, severe symptoms are a risk factor in and of themselves for dementia and Alzheimer's. And so, you know, when the brain health experts, the Lisa Mosconi's of the world and the people who literally, this is their job, have looked at that study, they're like, it doesn't really prove cause and effect. The women who were taking HRT in the study already were high risk for Alzheimer's and dementia, you know, and we have so many studies before this that's shown that it was protected. They really didn't think this was a big red flag. Right. Dr. Malone. And here's another uh, piece about, you know, when you do the deep dive in that study, of the women, and, and tell you how it was done, they looked at women who already had a diagnosis of dementia, and then they matched them 10 to one with women who didn't have a diagnosis of dementia. And then they looked back, okay, how many of those women took hormone replacement therapy? And is there a higher risk of hormone users in the dementia group versus their control or their matched group? Um, well, yes, there was a slightly higher, but those women who were in that dementia group 
also had several other independent risk factors for dementia. They were, more of them were overweight. Most of them had smoked. They've had, um, again, more likely to be symptomatic. And I, I, the piece of it that also, when you, you have to be careful when you're looking at statistics and it'll say 27% higher. The reality is, is I think in the, in the women who had dementia, 32% of the dementia patients had taken hormone replacement therapy sometime in the past, the amount of time that they had taken hormones was less than four years. It doesn't tell you what dose, it doesn't tell you anything about them. In the control group, well, 28% of them had taken hormone replacement therapy. And these are the people who didn't have dementia. So you're only talking about the difference between 28% and 32%. The majority, the overwhelming majority of women in both groups did not have dementia. You know, the dementia patients had, you know, who had taken hormones, two thirds of them did not have dementia and vice versa. You see what I mean? It's sort of, it doesn't, it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, all the people on one side had it and one of the people didn't. And that's the danger of, of studies like this. And I think that we have got to, that's, this is one of the, the great travesties of the Women's Health Initiative is because this study was actually started 30 years ago. We got the results you know, in, in uh, 2002, but it was actually started rolling patients in 1993. Imagine if we had 30 years of data on women who had taken HRT and followed them up. We don't have 30 years to answer these questions again about this. But again, Dr. Lisa Moscone, we've got to find other sort of markers for how to determine whether or not there is an effect without waiting 30 years, because that study is never going to get done. Nobody's going to do any more randomized studies and seeing who, let's just wait and see who gets dementia. Not going to happen. So, I mean, that's the good news is that it does not prove any cause and effect in that study. Interesting, but there's overwhelming evidence that said that it is beneficial. Again, for women who take, you know, around the time of the menopause or- Yeah, early. 60, that's, the, that's the key. It is such a pleasure to talk to you both. It is one o'clock. I think we might have time to ask you each one last thing. We have over a hundred questions. I think we only got to five or six. I, my apologies. Um, we will get to more questions in our next conversation. Also quite a few questions about um, breast cancer diagnoses or, or DCIS and estrogen and HRT. Um, we're gonna be doing more seminars on that as well. And there is one on our YouTube channel with um, a breast cancer survivor who's an OBGYN right. and is on the Alloy platform, Dr. Kryn Men, who has a lot of detail there. And we know that's a very specific topic that lots of people care about and we'll be covering that as well. Okay, parting words, Dr. Haver, Dr. Malone, someone who is my age, which is 51 and is not feeling great, maybe taking hormones, maybe isn't, and just kind of feeling bleh, a little overweight, a little spacey, a little forgetful. Um, let's say in this case, I am already taking hormones. I'm personally on the birth control pill. What advice do you have for a 51 year old or thereabouts woman just entering menopause? Just quick, um, how does she take care of herself? Dr. Remember, Hayden. health doesn't happen. I'm stealing her words, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Malone's words, <laughs> in isolation. And it's a toolkit. It's it's addressing everything. And I think as a gender, as as a society, we put ourselves last. And you know, I read a quote the other day that was instead of like, have I worked hard enough to deserve this rest? It's like, have I rested enough to do my best work? You know, to to, to move forward with love. And if you're not putting on your own oxygen mask and tending to all of your needs, nutrition, exercise, stress reduction, sleep, possible pharmacology, supplementation, if you are not, you know, all of those pods in the wheel will help that wheel spin faster in the right direction. Thank you. I agree Perfect. wholeheartedly. You know, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly. You know, health is not an accident. It is something that we actually plan for and that we have to make sure that we, once we have it, we maintain it. And so again, I cannot agree more with Dr. Haver. It is an intentional process that requires many things because not one pill, not one drug is going to come and save you at the end. All of the above. Estrogen helps. It, it, does. Does. <laughs> it certainly does, but you got to do all of it. Yes. If you really want to say, I want to be good and I want to be good for the next 25 years, all of the above. All of it. 
Thank you both so much. Thanks to all of you for attending and asking your questions. I promise we will get to them. These, these questions will be saved and we'll be answering them in various ways over the next few weeks. This recording will be on YouTube and we just thank you all for coming and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Dr. Haver and Dr. Malone. Thank Bye -bye. you.